Welcome to PR Talk, sponsored by the PRSA of Oregon. This is your host, Amy Rosenberg, founder of Veracity and author of A Modern Guide to Public Relations. Help other people find our podcast by subscribing, rating, giving us a review, or sharing on social media. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, everyone. I have Carmi McCook here with me today, and she is an executive public speaking and media interview trainer and coach. Hi, Carmi. Hi, Amy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. So before we get into our questions about kind of like speaking tips and Zoom tips and mistakes that you've seen. Can you just tell us, you know, what you do and um, what you're, it looks like you are in DC is where you're located, but you work with clients all over. So just tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Well, as you said, I'm an executive communications coach, but I'm not limited to executives. I will work with anybody that is sincerely wanting my help. (laughs) Um, I think a lot of it is under the umbrella of public speaking. Some people just think, well, that just means when you're up giving a speech. And actually, that's the umbrella for everything, for business presentations, for panel discussions, for media interviews. Uh, Anytime you're in front of people, it's all about public speaking. And that's what my focus is. That's what my whole career has pretty much been in communications. Okay. So it's helping people with the various uh, ways that you might speak is yeah okay. And I jokingly say my job is to help you put your best best foot forward and keep it out of your mouth. <laughs> well, how do you keep your foot out of your mouth? I don't know. <laughs> I tell you what, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> I think it happened to me literally yesterday on a phone call. So, what do you what what is a tip for if you're feeling like you're just rambling and saying the wrong thing? How do you stop yourself? Oh, well, that's probably the key right there. What you realize you're rambling, just stop. Stop dead right then and just say, Let, I, I'm sure I can say that a little clearer and then kind of smile, make a joke of it, and then just go on. Uh, but uh, that's a big tendency of people. They tend to over talk and over explain, and less is best. Mm-hmm. Does it help to have one liners for yourself to, to be prepared to stop? Like, or even move the conversation in a different direction if you're uncomfortable? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't want people to have all these kind of practiced, rehearsed lines that they throw in there because they start sounding a little canned. I just tend to naturally throw those things out sometimes. I was giving a speech one time, and I just went blank. I Mm -hmm. totally went blank. So, guys, it happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do not feel like, you know, it's the end of the world. And I just stopped and I looked at there. I said, well, you know, I had a train of thought, but it completely derailed. But I'm sure I'll think of it on my way home. Okay. And I went on with something else. And then later in the speech, I said, oh, I just remembered. And everybody just laughed Mm because, you know, they knew like, okay, she's a coach and she too screws up. It's okay. (laughs) Yeah. And you're being real and authentic. Yeah. yeah. That makes you relatable. Um, So yeah, just speaking of, I mean, I think that that is the biggest issue is people having nerves. So do you have any tips for people to get over their public speaking nerves or Zoom and even now Zoom nerves? Because those are two different things. Some people might have more nerves with Zoom versus in person. You're right. You know, it's it's weird. Some people say I'm fine with Zoom because I'm not in the room with them. I can do okay. Where other people say I was fine in the room, but once we're on Zoom, I see that camera and I freak out. So everybody's a little bit different. But speech anxiety is probably one of the biggest, uh, I'd say, career limiting issues you can have. Because if you cannot communicate effectively, clearly, succinctly and engagingly, your career is not going to go where it could probably go. Um, There is a great comment, uh, quote from Warren Buffett, who once told a bunch of Harvard MBA students, simply saying, if you learn to communicate clearly, succinctly, and put your thoughts together, I guarantee you will make at least 50% more in your lifetime. And it's true. It really does help. And what holds people back is the speech anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, I tell people, you know, there's really everybody says, oh, I have a fear of public speaking. No one has a fear of public speaking. What we have is a fear of failure Mm. and being humiliated and I won't do it. 
And um, that's what holds people back. So I have a whole class I teach. You know, I have a lot of people say, well, I have speech anxiety, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, all right, first we have to address that before we teach you how to become a great speaker, how to organize your content. We got to get you past the speech anxiety first. So uh, I do a lot of research and find out some quick tips, though, is basically calm down and quit trying to compare yourself to everybody else. <laughs> because mm-hmm. like, oh, Amy's the best speaker. I heard her talk. She's so good. I can't I'll never be as good as her. <laughs> and one thing I mean to my clients is, you know, stop saying what you can't do and start saying what you can do. Mm-hmm. I mean, we believe what we continually tell ourselves and uh, that's one of the toughest things with my clients is they're like, oh, well, I can't do that. I'll never be as good as so-and-so. Stop saying that because you make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. But, um, that's one of the biggest things is stop, stop the negative talk initially and then commit in your brain, I'm going to do this. And you need a good coach um, because we don't know what we don't know a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, I have found that most speech anxiety – goes back we weren't born that way it goes back to something that happened to us recently or in our childhood or somewhere that destroyed our our Mm self-confidence and that it stays with you it's like a scar that stays there forever and just shows up every time you're put in a situation where i don't want to be embarrassed again or i don't want to feel awkward again or you know yelled Mm -hmm. at again so it's, it's a, but I say it's all self-imposed expectations that we put on ourselves. Mm-hmm. Well, that's fascinating. I love just that thought that you that you just have a fear of failure. I mean, yeah. that's a good place to start. And if people can kind of get past that, then you go into the next steps of training, which I want to talk about. But first mm-hmm. of all, I just think your personal story is fascinating. <laughs> I was <laughs> digging into it and. As a child, you were very shy and afraid to speak up in school. And Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but you worked your way towards being um, on TV or, you know, a reporter for years. So how did you, (laughs) how did that happen? (laughs) I I totally, I'm one of those, I went from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, Yes, as a kid, uh, we were very poor and kids made fun of me. And uh, to be totally honest, I didn't have the best childhood, Uh, kind of a mean father who constantly told me, you know, how worthless I was and things like that. So I grew up feeling not worthy, not worthy of people hearing my voice, not worthy of me showing my face and that I should just stay in the background. Um, And I remembered um, (laughs) just holding back. And one day, my sixth grade teacher, Miss Sarah Adams, God love her. Mm -hmm. A shout out to the teachers out there. You Mm -hmm. are you change so many people's lives. Mm-hmm. But um, she said, Carmen, will you stay after class for a moment? And I thought, oh, crap, I am in <laughs> so much trouble. What did I do? I sat back here and kept my head down. And so when people left the room, she came back and she sat down and she turned the chair around so she was facing me. And she lifted my chin up. And I literally had grown my bangs out so long because I look like Cousin It. Because I thought, if you can't see me, I can't see you. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. I remember her taking a hairpin and pulling my bangs back and clipping them back. She lifted my chin up and going, she said, now that's much better. And she said, sweetie, I know you know the answers, but you mm-hmm. never raise your hand in class. And you're going to have to learn to do that because if you don't, people are not going to ever know how amazing you are. And I remember just sitting there going, I don't think anybody's ever said amazing and my name in the same sentence. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. just... Uh, but because I always adored her, my goal was I have to please Miss Adams. Mm. And, um, so it was great. It was great. She said, tomorrow I'm going to ask you about so-and-so, and I'm going to call on you, and I want you to answer the question. Mm-hmm. And my heart, even then, just thinking about it, went to racing. Mm. And she said, this isn't to scare you. I just want you to know it's coming. So uh, sure enough, the next day, we had, a t- I think it was about Egypt and the pyramids or something like that. And uh, maybe it was, you know, like, which is the biggest pyramid or something like that. And she said, Carmi, I bet you know that answer. And oh, my God. I was like, boom. But I, I knew people were looking because my heart was beating so loud. They had to be hearing it because <laughs> it was in my head. Um, and she walked back 
and just kind of put her hand on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, the, what is the biggest pyramid? And it's just the minute she touched me, I thought, all right, I can do this. And I think I kind of said the answer low. She says, and she repeated, she says, repeat it out loud. So Danny over there in the corner can hear you. And I said Mm -hmm. it again. And that was the beginning. (laughs) I said, Mm -hmm. that's the beginning of my public speaking. That's a wonderful, that's a beautiful Mm -hmm. story. Thank you. I'm so, that makes me so happy. So she was a great teacher. Yeah. So you obviously slowly built your confidence through school. So that gave you kind of the first start. And then after that, you started speaking up and then Mm. somehow, and then you must have just been interested in the topic because I think you studied it in school. Yeah. Uh, Well, that was the thing is that, you know, I tell people it wasn't the story of like, then the next day I ran for class president Mm -hmm. and I... You know, did I? No, it did not happen like that. It was a slow moving boat, uh, not a train. But um, it, I just started watching other people that I liked and seeing how they were talking and just started really practicing and I guess you could say acting. I started like, all right, if I were Miss Adams, how would I say this? And I did. For me, I started literally pretending I was somebody else. I was, so I guess I was an actress. First, <laughs> mm, that's cool. I mean, that's a way to get over yeah. any fear or just self confidence issues, I guess. And you, yeah. and it's almost like for a child, you're playing, playing exactly. Something. And I was very good at pretending, and I was I was in some fantasy world, so that was pretty good. But yeah, through the years, I did get better at it. And then in high school, I kind of started beginning helping people with their who did run for class president. Um, I would help them with their campaigns because I was pretty quick with uh, sayings and words and things like that. And um, then I would say them. So that made me get up in front of people more. And then people began to say, oh, you're pretty good at this. And I thought, well, all righty. And yeah, mm-hmm. then I just kind of gained my confidence grew. And then I decided when I went to school, I wanted um, Diane Sawyer. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. She was my idol. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be her. And um, so I thought that's what I want to do. I want to I want to be a news reporter. I want to disseminate news. I want to tell people the truth. And um, yeah, so I studied uh, broadcast communications at Georgia State. And um, at that time, too, CNN, you know, is in Atlanta. And it Mm -hmm. had really only just sort of kind of gotten this big name and everything. So uh, we had a lot of uh, people from CNN come to our class and speak to us. And that was always interesting. Of course, we did the CNN tour, but we got the backside of it. And I began talking to a lot of the reporters on the side and, you know, kind of learned some things about it. And I thought, yep, this is what I want to do. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, it, it really... You know, it built my confidence, and I started feeling better about it and studied Mm -hmm. it, graduated, actually won a scholarship to go to the BBC for a summer, and Mm -hmm. um, came back and thought, wow, I'm I'm this thing now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I got to the uh, local affiliates where I was, you know, kind of a freelancer and found out real quick it was nothing what I thought it was going to be. It's oh, <laughs> was oh, it my God. What, was it harder or just oh, not your style or Amy? Not my style. It, it was mm-hmm. truly the old if it bleeds, it leads mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I would write, you know, go out and do this story. And they're like, well, you know, get an interview with the mother whose child, child was just burned in the fire. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I, felt, I was really miscast in that job. <laughs> mm-hmm. So but, then you um, you yeah. moved over into, because of that, then you moved into helping people in cor- kind of corporate America? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I left that, and uh, but I did had learned a lot about production, too, because um, working in TV back then, you had a lot of, you, you had a lot of jobs. And so I learned a lot about production values and lighting and things like that, and already was good at interviewing people. So uh, I basically started writing, producing, directing things like TV commercials, corporate image pieces, uh, pieces, can't talk Mm -hmm. today, pieces, (laughs) but, you know, corporate image like for United Way and um, I did image pieces for AT&T and all kinds of big companies that we had down there. And um, in doing so, the image pieces usually involved working with CEOs, having them say something on, you know, like our company, blah, blah, blah. And I was always coaching them so that they would look and sound their best. And 
then they would come back and say, hey, you made our CEO look really good. He's got a media interview coming up. Could you help him with that? And I'm like, sure, I can do that. Mm-hmm. So this is how it sort of evolved. And um, then in um, one, of my, one of my clients, UPS, I went to work for them and worked in communications as communications manager in the corporate headquarters for 10 years and then left in 2000 and launched this little gig mm. <laughs> it's been going on since then. Yeah. Well, people, so, well, people do find this valuable and, but sometimes I'm sure that it, it's, it doesn't. So I, I did see in, on your website that you s- say that speaker training affects the bottom line. Yeah. Now listening to you, I could see why, but I'm curious. I'm sure you do get a little, not backlash, but just that people don't understand that. Uh, or people who are really interested in the numbers don't understand that. So can you talk about how it affects the bottom line? Yeah, um, I think because sometimes people don't connect the dots. They don't connect the ability to really connect with an audience is going to have a lot to do with whether that company decides to do business with you. You can have the best product in the world, but if you can't communicate to them in a way that they latch on and go, wow, that's impressive. I want to hear more. You're not going to get the sale. And the bottom line is not going to be what you wanted it to be. So I always tell people, you know, an investment in communication skills, public speaking, whether it be presentations, B2B presentations or whatever, is an investment in your future career. It's only going to help you. Mm-hmm. And well, and I could see that because you're working with people individually who are interested in their career, but then also with the corporate America, with mm-hmm. the companies, is it harder to kind of convey that as well, that it will help their company? You know, it was when I first started a little bit, but now I think uh, we've got a lot more savvy people out there running corporate America, and they're beginning to get the message. And I would say the majority of my clients are corporate. They're corporate uh, leaders who come in and say, we want our leadership team media trained. We want our leadership team uh, trained to give presentations or the CEO's got a speech or something like that. And then when it's successful, a lot of times they say, okay, we want to go back now to our mid-level managers. And I always encourage them, well, why not bring your admin people? Let's do a series for them too, because they're going to contribute to your bottom line too. It, you've got to look at it holistically. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it, I think that they're beginning to see that. I mean, I can give you one example of a client, and this is just one that because it stood out so, is a a technology company that I had uh, never heard of, called me one day and said, we need some help. And I think maybe you can help us. Like, why? Someone had referred him to me who had worked with me. Bottom line, they had done some work with a big company, uh, which is a name everybody knows, but I won't use names. But they had done gotten in and done some little jobs for them. So then a huge project came up with this company, in the technology field. So they thought, well, we're pretty much a shoe in We've already got our foot in the door. Well, they went and like everybody else, though, had to make a pitch and mm-hmm. they were said, thanks, but no thanks. So mm-hmm. the CEO called me. He says, we were flabbergasted. Mm-hmm. And uh, so can you come help us? And I looked at what they had presented and I said, who was in the audience? Well, it was the CEO. It was so-and-so, you know, the head of IT and this, that, and the other. I said, who was the decision maker? Well, ultimately the CEO. I said, you went over his head. Oh, <laughs> you know? interesting. You, yeah. You, you've got a, you've got a, who, who's the decision maker and who's the number one influencer. That's who you've got to talk to. But what they had done is, um, you, know, the, you know, the old saying that when someone asks you what time it is, they really don't want to know how to build a watch. Well, mm-hmm. that's what they had done. They had gone in and built a really good technology watch Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, how this widget works and these packets. And, you know, it was full of all the inside technology language. And two, the presentation went on for 45 minutes. Oh, no. And it's kind of boring. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, kind (laughs) of. Exactly. But um, I said, you got to trust me on this, but I'll help you. We redid the entire presentation. I looked at their slides and said, these have got to go. We redid all the slides changed what they were going to say. 
took uh, the presentation down to having four of his technology people speaking to only two of them. They took that 45-minute presentation. We reduced that thing down to 10 minutes, and they Mm -hmm. walked out with a $25 million contract. They had to beg to get their (laughs) foot back in the door. Wow, uh, that's helping the bottom line. (laughs) Well, yeah, and I'm thinking, uh, where's my money? But (laughs) Yeah, really, can you work on commission? (laughs) I know, I thought I need to change my model. But, you know, he called and was so ecstatic. When that mm-hmm. happened, he says, oh, my God, we're, we're still celebrating, and you've got to come out and celebrate with us. And I was like, fantastic. But that, you know, again, that was a that was just a real big exceptional story that they shared with me. But um, but I've had all of them come back and say, oh, my God, the difference that's made with how our mm-hmm. people are getting. We're, we're seeing that we're getting more interest. We're getting more clients. We're getting more nods. Mm-hmm. And it all comes down to the way you communicate. Mm, interesting. So kind of taking it back down to the individual level, just talking to individuals and giving them tips versus talking about corporate America. Um, so what is the biggest uh, public speaking mistake you've seen lately? Um, and I also want to hear about the biggest Zoom mistakes made lately, and mm. then also some tips for not how not to do this. Okay. Well, I think the biggest public speaking uh, tips are things that I have seen because a lot of my clients, I'll say, have you got anything recorded? Let me take a look at it. Um, No energy. You're up there. You're talking about something, let's say, in a B2B presentation. You're talking about your product and say you start out your conversation with, well, thank you all for letting us be here today. It's a real pleasure. Well, that tone, and do you sound like you're really happy to be there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so, and no smile. So um, I teach people, you know, you, you've got to let the words that are out of your mouth, the facial expressions and the tone of your voice all work together to, to build that uh, connection with your audience. So that's one. You've got to really think about that and use vocal intonation and use your tone and go up and down. Um, and really have energy behind your voice when you're speaking. So that's one. The other thing is someone gave uh, just reading from a script. Mm. That That is, you know, it's the go-to. I feel safe because I know I won't screw up if I just read everything on this page. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're not connecting with the audience that way. So I teach people, paraphrase. Go in and figure out what are the top three things you want them to know and just mm-hmm. talk about it. Don't get mm-hmm. married to the words. Because the more married to the words you are, the more you're going to screw up because your mm-hmm. brain is going, oh, I said the instead of a, and that throws you. Mm-hmm. So those, those are a couple of the big things that I've noticed. The other thing is going on too long, over-explaining, mm-hmm. uh, getting down into the weeds. Just keep it high level because, mm, uh-huh. you know, yeah, let your audience be part of your presentation. Ask questions. Uh, or tell them to hold their questions, talk short, and say at the end, we'll do Q&A. And most people will agree with that. But then mm-hmm. you open it up and pull them in. Mm-hmm. So that's the things that come to mind initially on just basically public speaking presentations. Zoom, gosh, how long have you got? I mean, <laughs> oh, oh, really? We could do a separate interview on, on oh, that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, you know, there's so many things because we all kind of got thrown into the Zoom world untrained. You know, they just mm-hmm. threw us in the water and art, you got to sink or swim. And so a lot of people I can say that I have worked with virtually now are better than they were a year ago. But the main thing is lighting, for heaven's mm. sakes. Put that computer somewhere that you've got front face lighting. You mm-hmm. don't want light all coming from the left or the right because one half of your face is dark. And do not be backlit. Look, you mm-hmm. know, have a, don't have a window behind you because then you're just blown out. So I've seen many people, they just look like a kind of a shadow talking to you. So number one, yeah, watch your lighting. Test it up beforehand. Uh, also, the camera angle. People will, often on laptops, they set it down and then they wind up looking down mm-hmm. at the camera. And the angle that the audience sees is that right up your neck and up the chin, which, mm-hmm. you know, is not the most flattering angle mm-hmm. for any of us. <laughs> mm-hmm. But also, I say, pretend like you're really in the office and you want to make eye contact. 
Mm -hmm. So you need to raise that camera up, raise the laptop up, whatever you've got, so that the camera angle is just maybe about an inch over your eye level so that Mm -hmm. you sort of look up when you speak and that keeps your face up and open. Um, And don't look at the thumbnails of the people talking. Look at the camera. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for people to do. But when people start looking down at the thumbnail again, we wouldn't do that in a business meeting. And Mm -hmm. that's what you got to kind of fake it. You got to act like you're really there. Um, The other thing, the background. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I saw (laughs) I had a client one day. Now, granted, maybe they teach or, or, you know, teaching uh, or what am I trying to say? I guess they're thinking that maybe oh, it's only training, so it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But it does matter. But one guy was in his kitchen and I, you know, give breaks for that. You got to go where you got to go when you're working from home. But he was in a small place, and behind him was the kitchen counter, full of dirty dishes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in the middle of the training, his cat jumped up on the counter and started licking all the plates, to which one of the other people oh. in the training, oh, yeah, one of the other people goes, ooh, yeah, Derek, yeah, get rid of that cat. And he mm-hmm. didn't even know it was on back there. So think about your background. Keep it mm-hmm. simple. Don't have a lot of garbage back there. But um, And then the other big final thing I will say, well, look at what you're wearing. Mm-hmm. If, you know, people have taken casual Friday to sloppy Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get on these Zoom calls and they literally look like they just rolled out of bed or finished gardening. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I have seen women who literally had not even combed their hair and they're sitting mm-hmm. there slouched over wearing a sweatshirt. And you got, this is a business meeting, guys. Would you mm-hmm. wear that to the office? So think about that. I've had mm-hmm. men wear baseball caps, and <laughs> there, there's this big shadow, and you're like, would you wear that to the office? Um, mm-hmm. T-shirts with sayings and things. Um, mm-hmm. One person had a T-shirt that said, I'm the original badass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Like, I'm like, okay, I know we're just training here, but, you know, this mm-hmm. is probably not something you would want to do. So, you know, yeah. think about those things. Well, it also makes you feel better. I think so when you're doing a Zoom, for me, especially well, with anyone, I, I want to present myself professionally. Mm-hmm. So if I don't brush my hair, I won't feel professional. That's that's it. It's not yes. really, I mean, maybe it's a little vanity, but. No, but there's nothing not, wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, it's like I want, especially my clients, I want them to see a certain way see me a certain way, but also yeah. with anything I'm doing that's recorded. So it's a podcast or a video. I stand up. I, yeah. I um, stand up and I stand straight. I don't know why I just feel better that way. Um, and it helps me not make extraneous noise, you know, because the, the video cameras can pick up noise. Um, yeah. And so anyways, but you learn that over time, like it doesn't, you learn from mistakes. Um, and sometimes people do just need to be told, hey, you know, you might want to not wear a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, exactly. And and you make a very good point about standing. Uh, I have this little thing I say, standing is always more commanding. And it, the, the main thing too, is that it keeps your energy level up because mm-hmm. you are standing and you're less likely to slump because if your posture slumps, so does your vocal intonation. Mm-hmm. You just start sounding after a while. You're just kind of really relaxed and you just don't project very much and you start mumbling. So mm-hmm. you don't want to do that. And standing usually forces it too, because if you start standing and you breathe from the diaphragm, you're just going to sound more energetic Mm-hmm. And you're going to come across a lot more credible and professional. Mm, okay. Yeah. So we, I stand for anything that's a performance, but for my client meetings, we have those once a month for all our clients and it's kind mm-hmm. of, we do these checklists. It's mm-hmm. like uh, checking in. Okay. What have we done? What do we need to do? And I need all of these screens open so I can follow my own agenda I created and these checklists. So I do sit because I, I'm like in a working meeting. You know what I yeah. mean? But I don't know. Maybe that's not the right approach. Maybe well, I need. No, to you're up. absolutely right. Each uh, different scenarios require different things. But I even tell people like, if you're doing a telephone interview or speaking on the telephone for a meeting or something, stand up when you're speaking. Um, in video, it's a little harder for people because you're limited with your camera angle and your camera space. But so if you do sit, keep you know sit straight up. Don't sit back in the chair. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Lean slightly forward. Keep your shoulders back and your spine straight and your energy up. And all of that is going to make you look a lot more engaging and sound a lot more credible and professional. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we're talking a lot about energy. Now, what about what is said? Like, so is practicing your talking points enough, for instance, for preparing for a media interview? Uh, because PR people, all we do, a lot of times what we do is, okay, let's do our little talking points and like <laughs> practice those. I mean, should we be doing more with our clients? Well, I think the main thing is uh, talking points often I get and they're too long. They need mm-hmm. to be short because for media interviews, it's all about quick, quick, quick. And um, I teach people, you know, to not have too many talking points. And particularly for media interviews, you don't have time to get everything in there. So I tell people, pick the top one or two things you really want people to know and sort of stay married to those two. That's what you want to stay on. And if the topic sort of veers off a little bit, you know, you can easily say, you know, well, that that's a great question and something that I'm really, you know, not prepared to, but we could do a whole separate interview on that another time. And then, you know, go back and say, well, but what I really want to do, getting back to so-and-so and take them back to what you want to speak on. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes back again. I think a lot of people in media interviews make the big mistake of, well, I'm the subject matter expert. They ask a question. I know the answer. So no big deal. Um, you need to practice. People mm-hmm. practice for their presentations, but they rarely ever practice for their media interviews. So mm-hmm. you know, get a colleague, throw out what you might be, get asked and practice your answers. Record it, play it back, see mm-hmm. how you sound. And I'm telling you, Amy, you will start self-correcting going, whoa, I didn't know I talked so long. I need to slow down or I need to speak more with more enthusiasm. But all of that stuff will start self-correcting when you watch yourself back on a video mm-hmm. recording. Okay. Um, And so is there a different way to prepare or train for media interviews versus public speaking? I think they're just, they're different, right? (laughs) Yeah, they are. There's a lot of crossover and there's certainly a lot of similarities that you use. But uh, yeah, they're different because with media interviews, you have to keep it very, very short. You don't have time to expound and go into a lot of details. So you've got to kind of keep it very big picture. You have Mm -hmm. to practice. You have to put into words. I tell people, first first draft, just write down what you want to say. Don't worry about making it grammatically or politically correct. Just what do you want to say? Now, the second draft, let's go, how can we say this in about 15 seconds? Or how Mm -hmm. can we say this in 20 seconds? Because in media interviews, that's about as long as you've got to talk. Um, Mm -hmm. It depends on the format. You know, like if you're on like Good Morning America or the Today Show or things like that, it's really going to be short little snippets. They're just looking for sound bites. Um, but if you're in a longer format like NPR, you know, where they really get deep diving into it, you still kind of stay focused, but don't talk too long. Don't ramble on because it is also supposed to be a volley between you and the host, not just you standing there giving a soliloquy. <laughs> so, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You need to give space a little right, bit for exactly. the hosts to do their job, essentially. There you go. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, how can people find you if they feel like they need help, w- whether it's for themselves or their companies? Well, as I say, I'm based in Washington, D.C., as I call it, the land of you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so. Yeah. So <laughs> probably have a lot of experience yeah. with some fun yeah. clients. <laughs> but um, but I uh, am, I have my website, which is so easy. It's uh, Carmi McCook and Associates. And uh, the email here is Carmi at Carmi.com if you want to reach me personally. But uh, yeah, certainly just do a Google search with the, my name. You'll find me. I come up. and But yeah, I train people literally all over the world. Uh, I've got an interview, uh, oh, excuse me, an interview. I've got a client that I'm starting with next uh, week who is off the coast of Africa. And oh. What a company. Yeah. So um, literally, I, to be honest, I had to look on, I'd never heard of this country before. <laughs> what, what country was it? it? Hold on, let me tell you. It is called <laughs> Marishu. Oh, okay. Marishu, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, I mean, you know, I'm pretty well traveled, but I'd heard of Madagascar, but it's really close to Madagascar. So, mm-hmm. anyway. so does your client have a, so you do help non-Americans with preparing mm-hmm. for speaking in the U.S. Is that what this client is needing you for 
Uh, no, uh, but th- there's two questions there. So, yeah, uh, I do help a lot of non-Americans with English is not their first language. A ton of clients on that. Uh, we can talk about that more if you wish. But, uh, you know, in her particular thing, she's the CEO of a company. She's a very, very bright girl, went to Oxford, started this company that is amazing. But she says, Carmi, I'm scared to death to speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, See, it happens to everybody. Yeah, right? yeah. She says, I'm so afraid that I'll, I'll just turn down doing certain things because I just, you know, don't feel like I speak well enough. And the thing I find too with a lot of, uh, if English is a second language, the fear is my accent is too strong and my grammar has to be perfect or they're not going to like me or they're going to make fun of me. And um, I, I just try to convince them, no. I do. Now, I will say this, Amy, I do not do. Uh, like speech pathology or accent reduction. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have a colleague I I work with, one of the associates, that if someone needs that, the accent is so strong that it is very challenging to hear them speak English, I will refer them to work work with her. But uh, then come back to me, and now we'll teach you how to put together a presentation and do it and learn your new skills. So that is the number one biggest issue. And And two, living in D.C., I get a lot of those clients. Because we're oh, pretty yeah. international city up here. Mm-hmm. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. It was good um, getting to know you, and just really interesting way to look at public speaking. It's not really about the speech per se; it's about your confidence. I didn't really think of that at all. So it is. <laughs> it's good to hear about that, right? Like, it's, well, it's you know, like, it's, it's about your confidence and connecting. It's, you've got to have the confidence, and you've got to connect with your audience. You the connection you can have brilliant content but if you do not connect with that audience you're just going to fall flat Mm -hmm. wonderful thank you you're welcome and i appreciate the opportunity to meet you kind of through the phone here but uh yeah i i really enjoyed this opportunity and i thank you for giving me the chance thanks for listening to the pr talk podcast find amy's book A Modern Guide to Public Relations, plus more PR Talk episodes at prtalk.co. And remember to subscribe, rate, and review.